Hey, Gabriella, welcome to the show. Thank you, Brittany. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for having me today. Of course, you are a scientist. And so I think we're going to get a little nerdy, a little sciencey today, right? Absolutely. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We're going to definitely have to um, define some things because you because we're going to be talking about microbiotas and micro RNA and DNA and like, oh, we're going to have to define some things, but I am so excited for it. Me too. I will try to explain this in a very simple way. So every everyone can understand this and get fun on, on this process. Perfect. Perfect. Well, let's kick off the interview with you telling us a little bit more about you. Where are you from? What did you study? And then how did you end up studying, you know, how microRNA affects fertility? Right. I came from Argentina. I'm from Buenos Aires. I am a scientific researcher. I spent 15 years working with the most complex fertility cases in the world, mainly from Latin America and Spain. Spain is very important for us because it's the second biggest fertility market in the world. So we are very happy to, to um, have not also study the woman from Latin America, but also compare the, the, the result from the microbiota with Spanish women too. And not also from Spanish women, but also from women that travel for different countries from Europe because uh, Sp Spain have the best fertility medicine in Europe. Hmm. So we have that we, our first baby born in Europe is a French baby boy. So we're really, really happy. Yeah. Cool. And so you said Spain is the second biggest fertility market. What's the first? The United States. Got it. Okay. That's why we want to repeat our science there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. I interrupted you. So Argentina, um, did you get a doctorate or what did you study? Had, have you always studied fertility? I am a molecular biologist and I did my PhD in, uh, in scientific medicine. So I'm a scientist dedicated to the medicine. Yeah. From here, from the University of Buenos Aires. Got it, got it, amazing. Well, um, you know, what interests you so much about fertility? Is that what you did your PhD in? Yes, absolutely. I'm a reproductive immunologist. I specialize in immunology and I apply the knowledge of immunology, which means inflammatory conditions, mm -hmm. to fertility potential. Mm -hmm. And I spent the last years trying to replace the traditional immunological drugs that are used to control inflammation for food supplements in order to restore the fertility potential in the more uh, complex fertility cases. Whoa, whoa, whoa. All right. So why does inflammation and in your immune system affect fertility? Oh, because um, we have a reproductive mucosa and this reproductive mucosa has a very important, a lot of very important functional role during fertility. For example, endometrial mucosa, the, the layer, the inner layer of the uterus where the embryo get implanted. Uh, are controlling, is controlling not only the implantation of the embryo, but also the development of the placenta. And the placenta is a very important organ women only have. Endometrium is a very important tissue women only have. And this makes us unique, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a unique opportunity to understand endometrial microbiota, for example, or the role of intestinal microbiota on endometrial functionality. And it's very important to understand that endometrium is very important for women's health because it's a, like a biological sensor. Mm -hmm. It's full of immune cells that will change the functionality according to signals from microbiome, but also for different places. This is the place where microRNAs takes a, takes a role. And according the state of the health of the woman, it will be able to enter in a process of implantation or placentation or not. Mm -hmm. Because pregnancy is a very hard condition for everyone. Mm. So we need to be prepared for that. Yeah. You can feel that you are healthy in general, but maybe it's not enough for gestation, right? Mm. You, we will need more immune metabolic balance in order to get pregnant. 
So the endometrium will check this. And if you're not okay, you are not able to implant or you're not able to carry the pregnancy to the end. Mm -hmm. How can so a that's woman, why, sorry. How can a woman know if she has inflammation then, if she feels healthy, but she doesn't realize? I spent the last 15 years trying to look for uh, non-invasive markers of this inflammation that, is, mm -hmm. uh, that are affecting fertility potentials. And we develop a test uh, when we include five different immunometabolic pathways that affect fertility potential with a blood test, a saliva test, and a vaginal swab. Mm -hmm. so, so a woman would probably get this test at like a doctor's office, right? Like she's not gonna buy this at Target, right? It's not like an at-home test to test herself. Actually, it is. Really? Can, in the future, okay. they can get it from a Target. Cool. Because uh, you can get a blood test from a, a self collection test. Yeah, yeah, prick your finger. You can, yep. Yeah, with your finger. And you can print the, the blood drop into a cellulosa car. We send mm. to a, a laboratory to analyze insulin level, vitamin level, every immunometabolic pathway that is affecting fertility. You can split into a saliva tube and send the saliva tube to us or to our yep. laboratory, to a clear lab. And from the swab, you can take this sample too at yeah. home. So it's yeah. a very easy self-collection test. Cool. And so let's say woman, a woman has inflammation. She didn't even realize it, but now she knows she has inflammation. This may be leading to the egg not being able to implant on the side of the uh, uterus. Um, right. What are ways that women can decrease their inflammation? Well, it depends on the state of the inflammation process. At the beginning, they can get pregnant. It depends on the process and when the woman decides to start to seek for pregnancy, right? At the beginning, they can get pregnant, but uh, uh, maybe it's the inflammation will affect the vascularization of the placenta. Mm -hmm. And so they, you can have uh, obstet obstetric complications, yeah. third trimester, second trimester complications, then you can get um, um, more inflammation in, in, the, in the placenta development, not vascularization, during the placenta development process. So you can suffer recurrent miscarriages. Mm -hmm. And if the problem continues and you get from an acute inflammation into a chronic inflammation, you will start an implantation failure problem. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. you will not be able to get pregnant. Yeah. And so what are the solutions though? Are there like drugs or what, how does one in decrease it? Since uh, you, we realized that inflammation have a subclinical time frame of 10 years, uh, we consider that uh, infertility is the first clinical alarm of this Mm -hmm. a silent and subclinical asymptomatic process. Yeah, so the so, woman doesn't know she has this issue until she tries to get pregnant, so yeah. Exactly, yeah. She, she's not sick and yet. Yeah. Yeah. She's in a process of getting a diabetes or a celiac disease or mm -hmm. any other inflammatory condition. Okay. But in, in the meantime, we can prevent this condition and get the woman pregnant in the process if we replace the drugs for food supplements. Why? Because tract screw up the microbiome. Mm. And the microbiome is the first barrier for an inflammatory condition. Okay. All right. Well, I feel like I just wanted to ask those questions so we could get a baseline here, <laughs> like what we're talking about, because we're about to dig deeper and it's going to get right. even more and more detailed oriented. So I wanted to make sure I asked some questions to like kind of set the stage. So right. with all of that, immunology, inflammation, fertility, all of that, we are now here and you're operating a company called Microgenesis. So why don't you tell our listeners, what is Microgenesis? What do y'all do? Microgenesis is a company that will change fertility industry. We want to change fertility industry because fertility industry is looking for a baby, but it's not focusing in the woman health and fertility potential is direct connected to woman health. Mm -hmm. So we focus on human health first. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, we developed this uh, non-invasive test, but also uh, free of drug treatments to restore fertility potential before IVF, before in vitro fertilization procedures. Or if the couple needs IVF for other reasons, for example, asospermic men or anatomical problem, tubal factors, etc., mm -hmm. we can improve fertility potential in women with our test and treatment. Got it. So what I hear you saying is, you know, we've been so focused on making babies that we should have just been focusing on improving the woman's health because the baby will happen. But I also hear you saying there are sometimes, you know, situations, whether it's the sperm or anatomy of the woman that you do need IVF. But if you took your protocol or your, you know, company solution, you could increase the chances of the success of that working out. Right. I got that. That's straight. true. Perfect. That's true. All right. So what is this test you have? And you keep talking about food supplements. So what are you testing? And then we'll get into the, to the solution part too. We realized that every immunometabolic pathway that is affecting the fertility potential during the time is connected to intestinal condition. Intestinal? In intestinal, right? <gasps> yes. Whoa. All right. I'm used to just talking about vaginas. So, all right, intestines, what do you have to do with my uterus? Vagina conditions is linked to intestinal condition too. Let Whoa. me explain why. Yeah. A microbiome, which means the microorganisms that are good for health, we need microorganisms to help us to metabolize vitamins, different elements to control our um, metabolism. Uh, microbiome disbalances are connected to different uh, diseases, for example, autistic child, celiac disease, uh, depression, mm -hmm. a lot of conditions are linked to um, missing functional microorganisms in the intestinal microbiome because these changes in the ecosystem of this microorganism will create different molecular signals. And these molecular signals are the ones that control the immune cells at the intestinal barrier. Mm -hmm. And the immune cells at the intestinal barriers controls intestinal permeability. So okay. if you have increased impermea intestinal permeability, you will have anemia, you will have uh, chronic hypovitaminosis, you will have autoimmune disorders because this uh, frontier will be corrupted. Mm -hmm. So every single inflammatory condition starts from there. All right. So let me break that down. I heard you and we have a lot of non-scientist listeners. So I'm going to break it down real quick. So what I heard you saying, correct me if I'm wrong, but you have bacteria that live in your gut we have 10 times more bacteria than we have human cells in our body, right. right? We're actually mostly bacteria. So we have all this bacteria in our gut. And sometimes that bacteria is imbalanced or just wrong. It has the wrong species of bacteria or whatever. And your immune system gets activated. Your immune system goes in there and starts to be like, you know, figure this out, you know, get balanced, right? And th with that immune response, your intestines actually become permeable, meaning that things can pass through the sides of your intestines. And obviously that's not a great situation because if things start to pass through your intestines, even on a small molecular level, and we're not talking about like, you know, your food is, your hamburger is going to fall out. It's that's not it. But just like small molecules start to, tra uh, to pass through the intestines, the rest of your immune system's like, oh my God, what is happening? You know, and then they start to attack it too. And now you have this huge chronic like inflammation disorder all over the place. Right. And I assume the last piece is that then your immune system is like, look, there's bacteria in your uterus and vagina too. Let's attack that. Is that also, is that the last piece of that puzzle? Exactly. Very oh, good. Nice Yay. <laughs> <laughs> did I, did I break it down? Right. That was, that's pretty much what you're, you, you are definitely deep, deep, deep scientists. It's taken me a long time to explain science to like five-year-olds. So that's, that was my take on it. <laughs> that's great. We need only the last piece in this puzzle. Okay. Which means microRNA. MicroRNA y'all. All right. MicroRNA. What's a microRNA, Gabriella? MicroRNAs are a very tiny molecules that controls genetic expression. 
Mm -hmm. But the most important thing is that microRNAs will be secreted according to the changes of the microbiome. Okay. Is it is it the bacteria's microRNA or is it humans' microRNA? It's a human microRNA okay. yep. secreted in response to bacteria. Yep, yep, got it. Or missing bacteria. Yep. Really quickly, I'm going to describe microRNA a little bit more. Again, I want to like keep everyone here with us. So everyone's heard of DNA, right? And so DNA is actually transcribed into this thing called RNA, and then RNA becomes protein. And for a really, really long time, scientists thought RNA was useless. It's just the middleman. You know, they don't really, RNA doesn't do anything, you know, it just is the messenger, you know? And then in the last like two decades, we've realized, oh my God, sometimes RNAs don't become proteins. They actually have their own jobs and they like go out and they do stuff and they're like are really, really important. And so that's a micro RNA is like one of those RNAs that doesn't end up being a, a, a protein, but ends up being a signal to do something else. Right. That's right. But who is controlling RNAs? I don't, the me. microRNAs are controlling RNAs. So according to the microRNA expression, you uh -huh. will control RNA. So you will control the synthesis of certain uh -huh. proteins. Okay. So that micro, so sometimes the RNA actually will go back to the DNA and say, hey, thanks for making me. I want you to make these RNAs now. Exactly. Or stop doing that. Oh yeah. Or it says, no, 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 no more of you. No more of that. Yeah. I exactly. definitely, oh my gosh, I'm, you're taking me back to college because whenever I give presentations, I like to personify proteins. So I would always be like, so this guy goes to that guy. And my professor would be like, they're not guys, they're trypsin, you know, they're like proteins, like, please stop. And I'm like, what? That's how it played out in my head. So you're letting me like fulfill my personification of proteins again. Thank you. <laughs> I love to personify my biology. Um, and those microRNAs will create a specific fingerprint. Mm. I mean, microbiome itself is a fingerprint. And we are studying just a part of it, which is connected to fertility. That's right, that's right. So we can identify the connection between the microbiome disbalance with the clinical problem in our patients so through the microRNA signature. So how do you get, find if it's in your gut, or is it in your uterus? Like, how do you find those microRNA signals? Very good question. They are produced in the intestinal barrier, in the intestinal lumen, uh -huh. but they are able to travel every single place in the human body because they are very tiny. Yeah. They're so boxes, they can, you know? Yeah. Like little they, boxes. they just do whatever they want. Exactly. <laughs> Even control your behavior. Yeah. So it depends. The process where, where the microRNAs are right now in your life, in this moment, we can connect this to the progression of the inflammatory condition yep. and how it's affecting fertility. Got it. Okay. So is it like a blood sample, saliva sample, vaginal swab? Like how are you, how are you discovering the microRNA levels in women? We measure the microRNA in the vagina swab because we know that are produced in the intestinal barrier and they travel to the reproductive tract. Mm -hmm. So we want to know if they are in the reproductive tract right now in a non-invasive way. So we are doing this swab mm -hmm. and we connect this information, the microRNAs, mm -hmm. with the blood markers insulin, autoantibodies, vitamins, etc. So we can predict or interpret the clinical impact of these microRNAs. All right. So woman wants to get pregnant. She gets a vaginal swab. She finds out that she has these really high levels of microRNA that are associated with gut inflammation, which is associated with high immune response, which then could lead to her not being able to get pregnant or stay pregnant. What is your solution then for that? How do we help her? First of all, we recognize the missing microorganism. Oh. You can lose uh, biodiversity, different species in the microbiome ecosystem mm -hmm. because we are using antibiotics, mm -hmm. because we are 
consuming industrialized food that contains antibiotics and are other medical uh, chemical compounds mm -hmm. that affects the the functionality of different bacteria. So we are losing bacteria during the time. Mm -hmm. So we we recognize which ones are the ones that you need to restore the balance. Yep. So we customize probiotic blendings. Probiotics are microorganism species strains that will replace this specific and functional microorganism you need. Mm -hmm. So we customize the probiotic blending for you according to the test. Then we try to help you to control or, 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 or will bring you dietary recommendations to avoid the problem in the future. Yeah. So we need to understand that we need to uh, select the uh, food components that will improve our microbiome balance and avoid the ones that will that are harming our, our microorganism that we need, yeah. right? Yeah. So dietary recommendation, customized probiotic blendings, mm -hmm. and we use nutraceuticals, which means vitamins, mm -hmm. amino acids, etc., to restore. Yeah. intestinal functionality to restore the immunometabolic problems, for example, high insulin levels or autoantibodies, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So how long does a woman have to, you know, take this regimented supplements and food dieting and everything for you to see a difference in her microRNA levels? According to our clinical study, we established uh, uh, a successful cycle of treatment of 90 days. 90 days. All right. Not bad. Not bad. After this period of time, women are ready to get pregnant mm. uh, for other 90 day period. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. If they can get pregnant during this process, yep. which only means 20% of them, uh -huh. they can repeat the, the 90 day treatment, nutraceutical treatment yep. again. Yep. And that's Our it. All right. So this, you know, when I first met you, when I first heard about your company, I was like, all right, I've never heard about micro RNA from your gut affecting your vagina and your uterus. I, I never heard about that. Okay. And then you told, you told me about it. We had a great call. You told me about the science and I was like, all right, all right, I'm in it. I'm buying it. She said, you know, like, this is good, but like, you haven't shown it to prove. Right. And then you showed me like all this data and success of fertility. And I, it blew my mind. You went from like cool science lady to like goddess science lady. <laughs> like I was like, oh, you did it. You did it. You're not just like writing about it and saying, wouldn't this be cool if it worked, but you actually showed that it works. So can you tell our listeners about like how many babies have you helped make and, and what kind of women that was important to me, what kind of woman you were getting pregnant it wasn't just a regular woman. It was a woman struggling with pregnancy. So tell us about that. We decided to uh, run our clinical study across Spain and Argentina with the hardest fertility cases because we want to prove our science in the woman that every single um, technology was uh, for reproductive uh, medicine was applied before and it didn't work. So um, we include 287 women that failed at least four in vitro fertilization procedures. So 287 around. women who have tried IVF four times and it failed every time. So almost quote unquote hopeless, right? Exactly. Like, yeah. Okay. Wow. Right. 40%, around 40% of them failed over the nation procedures before. That means in average were women at the age of 40 or 41 okay. years. And Damn, Gabriella, uh, you took the, I mean, that's a challenge. All right. So you're taking women over 40. They failed AV at four times. Like you had something to prove. You believed it. You knew it, it was good. Okay. All right. Sorry. I don't mean to give it away that, the, you know, <laughs> spoiler alert, it works, but uh, <laughs> go ahead. It worked. <laughs> it worked. We have 129 microgenesis babies <gasps> born so far. Um, that means that 75% of them 
get pregnant within six months after our treatment. Oh my gosh. Okay. So 75% get pregnant. And then of what percentage do continue to, and then they have birth. Cause I know that was one of the issues, right? Was not necessarily getting pregnant, but staying pregnant. Absolutely. 60% of them carry the pregnancy to the end. So yeah. that's mean light baby birth. Yes. Oh my gosh. Are any of the babies named microgenesis? <laughs> <laughs> I always ask our fertility founders this. I'm like, are any of the babies named Mosey Baby? And they're like, no, no, I don't think so. But <laughs> no, but um, I feel like they are my babies too. Yes, that's incredible. And so, um, what about the remaining women? Like, what is the you know what are we gonna do? I mean, uh, we found that eighty percent, uh, which means. Eight out of them, these hardest cases, have a proper uh, dysbiosis, intestinal dysbiosis, which means microbiome disbalance. Okay. So that means that 20% of mm -hmm. these 287 women have another problem not related to the intestinal condition. So that's why your probiotics and stuff didn't really change anything because it wasn't actually a inflammation exactly. based on gut health issue. Exactly. But the majority were. Absolutely. The majority yes. were that. Wow. And like all the doctors were just not focusing on their gut health. They were focusing on everything else health. Oh. Absolutely. That's why uh, after we finished our clinical study one year ago, we started during the pandemic to evaluate women uh, at the beginning of the journey, which means at the first IVF attempt or even women that are uh, trying to get pregnant spontaneously without in vitro fertilization procedures. Mm -hmm. So we extend our study to a fertility clinic in Zaragoza, Spain, and we recruited to the, the pandemic uh, 11 women at the first IVF attempt, and 10 out of these 11 women got pregnant. <gasps> Wow. Oh my God. And in Argentina, in Buenos Aires, we have our medical office. So we work di direct with our patients yeah. here. And we, during the pandemic, we recruited 15 women at the beginning of the journey. That's mean before IVF procedures. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, 14 out of the 15 women are already pregnant. Which means that if we anticipate the a uh, painful IBF journey that which means in average 10 years looking for pregnancy spent on IVF procedures, mm -hmm. we can get even more results. So better results quicker. And I would imagine less expensive, right? IVF is super expensive. So you're truly like disrupting the entire market with this, huh? This is the point. Uh, most of women are not able to attend to a fertility clinic for IVF. Yep. So this is a way to democratize fertility. Yeah. yeah. Wow. What do you, do you think that, um, all right, well, I'm going to put a pin in that question. Let me ask one more about microgenesis. So what's the next step? What are you going to do next? You proved it out in Argentina. You did it in Spain. So what are you, what are you working on now? Now we are repeating the same in the United States. Mm -hmm. We will repeat our clinical study at Mold Center at Mott Clinical Certain uh, in, at Wayne State University in Detroit. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a multi-center uh, study, so women can uh, be included in the study from different uh, parts of the United States, from different fertility clinics. And we will include in this opportunity 106 couples mm -hmm. that fail uh, uh, IVF procedure before. Mm -hmm. So we want to repeat the same proof of concept but at the same time, because we don't need any regulatory approval for the non-invasive yep. yep. and the probiotics and the nutraceuticals, we will start um, providing the test for a non-cost test and treatment for 40 women in the United States. Amazing. So when can, you know, if we have, a, if we have women listening that are like, when can I use this as a consumer? What do you think the timeline on that is? Is it Two years, five years, 10 years? Um, uh, we, we will start uh, with uh, 40 uh, women in January, recruiting mm -hmm. this woman in January. 
So uh, after that, uh, if if we get good results, we will start working with OBGYNs from the United States. Mm -hmm. So we want to start working with them as soon as possible. Yeah. So we are estimating to launch our tests and treatment next year. Yeah. As soon okay. as possible. Amazing. So cool. I love microRNA. I love bacteria. My PhD was in, you know, I worked in E. coli bacteria and my whole PhD thesis was around um, a small RNA that affected mutation. So you are like, I'm like, yes, bacteria, small RNAs. I'm all for it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, do you think like, so here we have like gut health affecting women's health in other ways. Do you think gut health is affecting other types of women's health issues? Absolutely. For example, vaginitis, endometriosis, PCOS, menopause, premenopause. We are trying to apply our platform to oh. every single condition in women's health related to yes. intestinal condition. And is it just a hypothesis that potentially you could find microRNA markers and if you, you know, balance the microbiome and the gut, then maybe menopausal symptoms will go down. Are those all hypotheses or are there actually papers that show the gut health affects us those things? This is because we can split our clinical study in different uh, groups uh -huh. of patients yeah. that already had endometriosis, PCOS or premenopause conditions. So yeah. that's why we consider that this will these clinical data allow us to provide the non-invasive tests and the nutraceutical yeah. food supplements for everyone. Me. Oh man. Well, this has been so awesome. Seriously, so fun. You have been, you've taken me back. I feel like I'm still worth my uh, PhD title. <laughs> <laughs> so fun. Um, I have two last questions for you that our listeners really enjoy. The first one is we have a lot of aspiring femtech founders that listen. And what is an area in women's health and wellness that you think still needs innovating? Um, I think fertility is the most important one because um, new opportunity for women start when you have the right question mm -hmm. and the right question will be why uh, the infertility women are not able to, to uh, attend a treatment or uh, because uh, IVF procedure is not a very effective treatment, mm -hmm. but it's also very, very expensive in most of the countries. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, IVF, uh, reproductive medicine in general, uh, is based on a 30-year-old technology. Mm -hmm. So we need more innovation in this field. Yeah. And we need more innovation for women that are not able to pay for an IVF procedure. Yeah. So yeah. I think fertility is very uh, good opportunity for uh, science, for entrepreneurs, especially we, we are women, we are two uh, female co-founders in microgenesis, both of us are mothers, and we think in, in that way. This is very important, not only for women health to prevent mm -hmm. a future inflammatory condition, but also for the babies. Because if we modulate microbiome functionality, we will prevent early onset diseases in the babies related to this condition in women. Whoa. Okay. Yep. Well, that's what our tagline is women's health is everyone's health. Exactly. <laughs> you know? Exactly. This is the idea. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And our last question is what do you think the femtech industry as a whole needs the most right now in order to be successful? Um, I think that new markers will open when you have the, the right key, right? Mm hmm. And in order to have the right key, we need to have more female entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And we need to have more female entrepreneurs that work in femtech uh, areas. So we need also female uh, groups of investors that help female entrepreneurs to yeah. be successful. That's right. Yep. Well, we get that suggestion all the time. We need more money. And uh, <laughs> the easiest way for us to get money is to have more women investing, you know? So it's not only about the investment, but also partner with people that know how to go to the market, yep, how yep. to create a company, and all this difficult process for scientists. That's right. 
Yeah, science. I, oh, girl, I feel you. I feel you there. When I started my <laughs> first company, I was like, I have no idea what I'm doing. I've never taken business and they're accounting. I have literally zero clue, but I'm passionate and I have this idea and more. But scientists, once we get some knowledge around how to start a company, we're fantastic entrepreneurs because entrepreneurship is all about um, pilot testing. And that's what scientists do all day. We say, hey, I have an idea. Here's the data. I'm going to test it. Oh, look, the data says that I was wrong. No worries. I'll just go back to the beginning. Scientists are very humble like that. We just say, oh, well, look at the data said no. All right. And that's what entrepreneurs need. You know, they need to be able to say, hey, the market doesn't like that ad campaign or doesn't like that product color or whatever and be willing to pivot and, and listen to the market. So I think scientists are the best entrepreneurs, honestly. <laughs> I agree with you. Yeah, Brittany. Totally. Well, uh, Gabriella, thank you so much for your time today. You are amazing. Um, I'm going to be thinking about my gut all day. <laughs> thank you, Brittany. This was really fun and I'm happy to be here. So thank you for having me today. <laughs>